Okay, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles uh, to the book of Revelation once more. And we're going to begin reading again in chapter 20, verse 11. But we're going to make the transition into chapter 21 and read down to verse 8 in chapter 21. And our theme, a uh, very clear theme, in a sense, of this study, and that is the, the topic of eternity. Because we're going to be looking at the eternal abode of those who die without Christ, and then we're beginning to get our first glimpse of the eternal bliss of those that are in Christ. And uh, we're going to see a tremendous contrast between these destinies as we consider these together. So beginning verse 11, it says this in, in Revelation 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every one or every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And again, very sobering. God will bless that reading of his word uh, unto us uh, this morning. So as we're continuing at the great white throne judgment, and uh, we had considered last time the place of the judgment, we'd emphasized uh, the fact that um, uh, there was no place to hide anymore uh, for man. Uh, uh, the, the earth and the heaven had fled away in verse 11. Uh, from his face, the face of the Lord Jesus. And it is just interesting to think of this, that um, uh, that people who have spent their lives trying to run away from Christ uh, to avoid his gaze, as it were, or considering him, uh, will have to stare into that face. And again, the face of him, it says, uh, whose uh, face of him uh, the white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven uh, fled away. They're going to look it into the face of him. And we think of uh, the Lord Jesus, we, we think of that face that was marred more than any man's, uh, that face that uh, had been blindfolded and buffeted by men, uh, the hair plucked out from his beard, his visage marred, as we said, more than any, and uh, hardly recognizable as a human being. But it tells us in Revelation that in his glorified state, his eyes are like a flame of fire. And they're going to look into that face. And it'll be a terribly fearful thing for them to look into 
those eyes, to look at that person who they have so scorned, so rejected, so determined. I, we, we will not have this man. And yet they will have to look at that one, that person. Now, here's the other interesting thing is that when we look at our destiny, there's a reference to the face as well. And I want you just to look at Revelation 22. And notice it says, uh, verse uh, 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And so what a contrast. Here are people that, that the last thing they want to do is see his face, and they're going to be looking at him. And yet for us, we long to see his face. We, we often sing face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me? And so it tells us we're assured we will see his face, but we're not going to have the same reaction. Uh, they're going to see his face. They're going to be cowering in 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 terror at looking into his eyes we are just going to be lost in love and wonder and adoration when we see his face and so again just what a contrast the face of him and of course we've said that uh, they uh, the the verse tells us that the heaven and earth uh, fled away the end of the old order and since the days of cain the world has been a place uh, where man has sought to find meaning and purpose apart from God, and everything that they sought to find meaning is gone. It's disappeared, and it's just them and him. That's the scenario. So now we, we move on to the, the question of the people who were judged. And we see this in verse 12. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So again, their, their bodies clearly are resurrected, and they, they clearly have a resurrection body. They're able to stand. They're going to be standing before him, looking at him. And so, again, we're, we were reminded from John chapter 5 about these two resurrections, and it's good just to reaffirm this truth. John 5 is a very critical chapter in understanding these things. Uh, verse 28, marvel not at this. John 5, 28, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth at his command, at the shout of his command, the graves will empty and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Okay, this is, we looked at that last time. This is the first resurrection. That's the saved of all the ages will be part of the first resurrection. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or the resurrection of judgment. So they're going to be raised for the dead for one purpose, and that is for judgment. <laughs> That's their purpose of resurrection, for judgment, and of course, their subsequent sentencing. So we, we say this, that there are two separate resurrections, uh, both summoned by the voice of the Son of God. As we said, just as Lazarus was called out of the grave by his voice, so all humanity will be called and respond to his command. And so the resurrection of life, uh, or what we know as the first resurrection, uh, was those that have done good. So we, we, we need to try and identify, based on that verse in John 5, what is the good that they did to have been part of this first resurrection? And so that's an important thing. What, what, is, the, what is the good that they did, as opposed to the evil that will condemn men uh, to a lost eternity? So what's the good they have done? That means they will not appear before the resurrection of judgment. And so again, we, we want to go back to John 5 uh, to see if we can get a clue of what was the good that was done uh, that guarantees that they will not appear before this resurrection of judgment. And so John 5 is very helpful again in understanding this passage. John 5, verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, or Truth, truth, veritas, veritas, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. <laughs> so what is the good that they did? Well, they believe God. That's the good, it, it, right? Without faith, 
it is impossible to please God. Uh, he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So what did they do? Well, they believed. They believed the testimony that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. They believed that, and that was the good that they did. And as a result of that, uh, they will not come into condemnation, but they have passed from death to life. Look at John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. <laughs> you know, the best good we ever did and will ever do is put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. <laughs> Nothing's better than that. Uh, is the greatest thing that we ever did. And as a result of that, uh, in a sense, the judgment that should have been ours was born by him. I just uh, was captivated last Lord's Day morning. Uh, him was given out. Um, that ha has been in my mind ever since. That it was given out the breaking of bread. And it, it goes like this. Give me a sight, O Savior, of thy wondrous love to me. The love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. Oh, help me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant for thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. And uh, then one other verse that really, I, this is the one that just can't get it out of my head. A wonder of all wonders, that through thy death for me, my open sins, my secret sins, might all forgiven be. Oh, help me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant for thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. And I, I've been living on the good of that hymn all week long since last Lord's Day. Just, just amazing. The wonder of it, that he would be willing to bear my judgment, the judgment that should have been mine, to stand in my place, in my stead, to take the, the 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 judgment that should have been mine. And so uh, we do not have to worry about the great white throne judgment. We are not part of that resurrection unto judgment because our sin has already been judged on Calvary. We're part of a resurrection of life because he's given us eternal life uh, through, through the Lord Jesus. And so what a wonderful prospect is ours as we think of those things. But however, just good to remind ourselves, we also will look into that face and we will stand before another judgment seat. And of course, that is the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Of course, this is before the passage here in Revelation 20. This is after the rapture and before the wedding. Uh, but it's just good to be reminded that we indeed will look into that face and we'll give an account not of our sins because our sins and iniquities, he will, will remember them no more. But we will give an account for our service. What we've done for the Lord Jesus, uh, the motives behind it, was it for his glory or was it for self-glory? Uh, basically, um, our works will be assessed and all of that which was done with wrong motivation or in the energy of the flesh, will all be burned up. And what survives, that will be rewarded for. And so it's just good to remind ourselves this day that um, are, are we producing wood, hay, and stubble, that which will go up in the fire, or gold, silver, precious stones that will, will endure the fire, and will indeed have something to reward. And again, I just was thinking, I, I mentioned this before, but I find it just interesting that gold and silver and precious stones, they're all under the earth. In other words, they're not seen. Uh, you know, they, you, you go down a mine you, to get them, whereas wood, hay, and stubble is all above the earth. And so could it be that the, the Lord is going to be judging what is not seen, the unseen motivations of the heart, the unseen things that were done without any observation of men and the lord will will indeed see those things and uh, and reward us for them and so again we just we just want to uh, be aware of our responsibility and our accountability for our service 
And so it's just good to be reminded. But again, what a joy it is to us to realize that the Lord bore the judgment. All our judgment borne by thee. And so we have nothing to fear and nothing to face in terms of our sins. They've all been dealt with at Calvary. And so they're standing. Uh, it says here, again, back in our passage, um, <clears throat> it, it says, um, uh, I saw the great great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There's found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. I want you to notice their posture. They're standing. And of course, it's the idea of standing is that when when a sentence is about to, even in our courts, they have to stand for the sentencing. They have to stand in the dock for the sentencing. And so that's the idea. Their standing posture means that they are now about to be sentenced. And notice it's the dead, small and great. I think it's just interesting to notice that, that the small and great. So that's the, the we might say the insignificant people who the world doesn't know anything about. Um, you know, they lived their lives. They died. They never made the history books. They never made the who's who list. Um, you know, apart from their immediate contacts, nobody knew they ever existed. The small, but also the great. Uh, this is the the movers and shakers of our world, the, of the world of history. They're going to stand before the Lord Jesus. And it's sometimes just good to, to meditate on this, uh, to think of men like Napoleon Bonaparte, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Alexander the Great, the elites uh, of our day, uh, people that think they know how we should live. They don't trust Christ. They are going to stand before the Lord Jesus. All these, these elites, uh, they're going to stand before him. And of course, they'll all be on level ground. All of their wealth and influence will not count at all on that day. It, will, it just comes down to this. What did a person do with Christ? That's the bottom line. That's the only thing that matters. What did they do with him? And so notice as well, he says, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. He, he talks about um, uh, <clears throat> the fact that um, uh, these people um, that, that, that are before this great white throne, uh, <clears throat> whoever they are, doesn't make any difference. They're all going to stand uh, there before this throne, this great white throne. Uh, <clears throat> and notice it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. It's interesting because we, we've said all judgment is given unto the Son. So, again, isn't this a wonderful affirmation of the deity of the Lord Jesus? They're standing before God, but who is God? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who they're going to stand before. It's, again, I just love these constant affirmations of deity. Uh, notice, uh, we're jumping ahead here. We'll come back to that verse, but I want you to look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So <clears throat> I want you to notice that the second resurrection will include all those that have been buried at sea. The sea gave up the dead. Uh, all those whose ashes were scattered, maybe in the ocean or wherever. Death and hell, or Hades, gave up the dead that were in them. And so remember, we talked about uh, what about the, those that die outside of Christ now? Where are they now? Well, they're awaiting their, their hearing at the court. And so just like today, if somebody was a, a criminal who was arrested, and they were considered to be a danger to society, they would be kept in prison until their trial, and then they'd be sentenced. And then after their sentencing, they would suffer their punishment. And so there is a place of, of holding the wicked dead until the court decides their final fate. And that place is called Hades. We, we get a glimpse of it in Luke chapter 16, where we see the rich man and Lazarus in that story. And of course, the rich man is 
in Hades. That's the place where the unsaved dead are found. And we notice that it is a place of conscious torment. Torment. He's, he talks about being tormented in this flame. But but he and so he, so just using him as an example, he's there and he's still there. And I do believe he was a real person. The Lord was telling a story. He didn't use his name, I think, for a reason, because in case any of the relatives, he didn't want to offend anybody, but uh, he uses the name of Lazarus because he calls his own, own by name. He doesn't mention the rich man's name. But I do believe that they were real people. And here he is, this real person who was so influential, so wealthy, but had not a relationship with God. And so here he is in this place of torment. He's there till this hour. But when the great white throne judgment occurs at the end of the millennial kingdom, so he's going to be there in at least another thousand years. He'll be there. But then he and the rest of those that are with him in Hades will now stand in a resurrected body. Uh, perhaps uh, we talked before that they may have an intermediate body in between because they're tormented in the flame and he wants a drop of water to cool his tongue. All seems like there's some kind of a body there. There's an intermediate body, but then they'll be given the resurrected body. And by that, in that body, they will stand before the great white throne. And then at the end of the judgment, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. So that's why we emphasize death and hell or Hades delivered up the dead, which were in them. And then it talks about their judgment. So I want to just talk about the, the judgment here. Now, again, it's not that there's any question. The reason that they've been in Hades is that God already knows the outcome of the trial. The trial is not for God's benefit. He already knows whether somebody accepted his son or rejected his son. He, he doesn't need informing of that. The, the trial is for their benefit to show their absolute guilt and God's absolute righteousness in sentencing them. That's the point of it. And so he, he talks about books that will be opened. And so he mentions two particular books. We'll see this in verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. <clears throat> so we got, we got the books and the book. The books were opened and the book of life. So what, what, are the, what are these two things? Well, I want to suggest to you that the books are the records of earth. This is the personal record of each individual sinner from birth until their death. Okay. And, and the Lord it, it keeps perfect records, right? His archives are perfectly kept, <laughs> uh, right? So, so uh, it, I, I also often like to think of this: of if if I wasn't saved, just imagine yourself having your life story played back to you. <laughs> It'd be pretty intimidating, wouldn't it? I mean, if if we could do that even now on this on this screen, and my life story was put before you. <laughs> I would be looking if I could find an erase button because I wouldn't want you to see. And it would not just be what I did, but what I thought about doing. And I would feel distinctly ashamed and embarrassed that you would be exposed to what my life has been. But I suspect if it was you who was on the screen, <laughs> you would be passing, pressing the erase button too. You wouldn't want me to know about your life. And so here, here it is. This is your life. That's what's going to be presented to the person. The complete personal record of each individual sinner from birth to death. Now, just look at a verse because it, it talks about according to their works. And most people, when they see this, they tend to think in terms of, oh, God is going to look at the good works we did and somehow it's going to influence him. But it doesn't say according to their good works. It says according to their works. And a very helpful verse I find concerning this is in the book of Ecclesiastes. But I find it very good, especially in gospel preaching. I find this a very, very telling verse. And so if you want to just turn there to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14. And I find it a very, very convicting 
verse. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, isn't that a very comprehensive verse? God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so <clears throat> this presentation of this is your life will be in the words of Oliver Cromwell when he was having his portrait painted, it will be warts and all, warts and all. Every detail will be there. It will be the, the cumulative action of a lifetime. <clears throat> you, you, it'll be like watching your life played back before you in stunned embarrassment. Not just what you did, and you won't be, the person watching this, seeing this presented will not be able to deny anything or even put a positive spin on it. It'll be presented in such plain, clear terms that this person's life, including what they thought about, and of course the Lord says that it's not just what you did, but what you thought about doing. If a man looks at a woman to lust after her, the Lord Jesus says, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's not just what you did, but it's all the things you imagined doing. Because God knows, doesn't he? The, the thoughts and imaginations of men's hearts are only evil continually, but God is going to present that to man. It'll be brought before them. And so the result of this this evidence presented will be this. Every mouth will be stopped and all the world will be guilty before God. And they will know it. And they, they, there'll be no objections. There'll be no, but your honor, <laughs> no, no objections because the evidence will be so um, clear and incontrovertible that just, they won't be able to say a thing. And then it's interesting because it says another book was opened, which is the book of life. If the other books were the records of earth, we believe that the, the book of life is the register of heaven. Now, remember, all the true believers had their part in the first resurrection, and they're not here present at the great white throne judgment. So why would it be necessary to have the book of life there in the first place? Because there may be a number of people there who thought that they were Christians, but they weren't. They were religious. They did acts for God. Do you remember the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 7, where it was said, well, didn't we do this in your name? And, uh, you know, we cast out demons in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name. And the Lord will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. <laughs> and so the reason the book of life is there is there might be some that will say, but but surely my name's in the book of life. And so, okay, the Lord will say, all right, let's just take a check. And so he'll look down and he'll look at the register and no, sorry, there's nobody by your name here. And so it'll be to show them that <clears throat> their name's not in that book, even though they were deluded into thinking, you know, they may have been on some kind of church register but they're not on the registry of heaven. And so again, we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what is this book of life and what is it all about? How do I get my name there? How do I know my name is there? That's really important. And so let's just again, get help from scripture as we compare scripture with scripture. I want you to look at Revelation 13, verse eight. We've already looked at it before, but it says all that dwell on the earth shall worship him. It's not the Lord Jesus, but it's the antichrist whose names are not written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, all I want you to just notice at this point is this book of life is not just a book of life, but it's a book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it's connected. This book 
<clears throat> has some direct connection with the lamb slain. I want you to look again at Revelation um, 21, <clears throat> Revelation 21 and verse 27. It says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what we can say is this, that this Lamb's book of life, or the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, is a record of the names of all those who have at some point during their lifetime received eternal life through Christ by recognize him, recognizing him as God's lamb. So it's all connected with God's lamb, what they did with the lamb of God. And so we, we look through the scriptures and we see this emphasis, don't we, on the lamb. So you think of the story of Cain and Abel, two men raised in the same house, by the same parents, under the same circumstances. No environmental difference whatsoever. And they come at a prescribed time, and they bring an offering before God. And we know the story. Cain brings the fruit of a cursed earth to God. And no matter how nice it looked, it was still ultimately the fruit of a cursed earth. But here comes Abel, and he brings a lamb. And it's, it's a lovely picture. And I, I just love this illustration. It's kind of, uh, it's it's recognizing, look, I deserve die, death, right? The wages of sin is death. I know that I deserve death. But I also know that God has provided an innocent substitute to take my judgment. And so they would often, they put their hands on the head of the lamb. And they're basically <laughs> giving a story here. I'm transferring my guilt to this innocent animal, and this in innocent animal is going to, as it were, die in my place, in my stead. And so th there's that lovely picture. And of course, it, they didn't just make this up. They got it from God's example. Just look back at Genesis 3 and verse 21. Remember that Adam and Eve had tried to clothe themselves um, <clears throat> with fig leaves? Again, trying to cover up their nakedness and shame by a now cursed earth and the parts of it. And yet it says in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And I believe that in that action, of course, to be clothed, their nakedness and shame to be clothed, these animals that their skins were used had to be killed. Uh, in a sense, the first physical death, there's already a spiritual death taking place with Adam and Eve, but now the first physical death they probably ever witnessed was an animal slain so that they could be covered up from their nakedness and shame. And so as we trace it through the scriptures, story of Abraham and Isaac as they go up Mount Moriah, and of course, the great question, where is the lamb? We've got the wood, we got the, the fire, but where's the lamb? And God will provide himself a lamb. But what a what a big hint in the scriptures that God is actually going to provide himself a lamb because the Lord Jesus is going to be that lamb, right? So, uh, and, and then, of course, the Passover lamb. Again, everyone's going to die, all the firstborn of Egypt. But when the angel of death comes to that house, he sees that death has already taken place in the form of an innocent substitute. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And then as we get to our New Testament, we think of the lovely testimony of John the baptizer. As he saw the Lord Jesus, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And so I want just to get this, this lovely picture. And of course, it's all over the Bible, isn't it? Um, some people have tried to purge the Bible of all its bloody passages. They don't, they don't like this idea of a God that demands blood, but without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so all of this is Old Testament saints looking forward 
to God's lamb, putting their hands on individual lambs, saying, I deserve death, but this substitute is good. But they're looking forward. They realize that a lamb's not really going to cut it. It needs to be the lamb of God. So they're looking forward in anticipation. We, by faith, at a certain point in our lives, we realized, I deserve death. And I realized the Lord Jesus was my substitute. And by faith, as it were, I put my hands and say, Lord, I transfer my guilt to you and trust that you paid the penalty that I rightly deserved. I can't help tell this story without thinking of my uh, my oldest boy, James, at four years of age. In, we were in the Philippines. We were doing family devotions. And I was talking about Noah, that when he came out of the ark, the first thing he did was offer a, a lamb. And I mentioned the fact that he was a sinner like everybody else, but he recognized he needed a savior. And so he had a lamb. And so James said to me with all sincerity, four years of age, dad, where can I get a lamb? I said, why do you want a lamb? He said, because I'm a sinner. So I took him to John 129 and I said, Jesus is the lamb. Behold, the lamb of God. And there then, four years of age, he trusted in Christ as his personal savior, never wavered for a second since that day. And so isn't that amazing? This is so so this is how a person gets their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's by trusting in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so as the this person is standing before the great white throne, and he's saying, But but you know, surely my name must be in there. And so a search is made. No, there was no point in your life. There's lots of religious activity. <laughs> You, you, yeah, you you went to Sunday school. Yeah, you, you were on the roll of the Sunday school. Uh, yeah, you went to church. But there was never a moment where you saw yourself as one deserving judgment and you trusted in God's lamb as your substitute. So your name is not here. And so what an awful, awful reality will come to that person. And I that's why I feel like for somebody who's had so much light, but never trusted in the Lamb of God, this judgment day is going to be absolutely a shock to them because they're not expecting to be there. And so they'll say, but can't you just check? I'm pretty sure my name's in that book. And to hear the awful words, no, no, there's other people with that surname, but but not you. You're not here. It's good to be sure this morning as we are listening and then perhaps those that will listen later are you sure that your name is in that book has there been a moment where you personally have exercised faith in the lord jesus as the lamb that died in your place that took the judgment that was rightly yours that bore in his own body on that tree your sin on calvary and there was a point that you trusted in him well we come now to the penalty of the judgment. And I want you to notice it says in verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Because it's been said often that if you have two births, <laughs> you only have one death. You don't have the second death. If you're born again, born physically, born spiritually by trusting in the uplifted Savior who died on that center cross. If you if you do that, then then you you will be born twice. You'll only die once. Some of us may not die at all. We may be raptured. <laughs> that will be a wonderful thing. But you'll, but at the very maximum, you'll die once. But if you're not born twice, you will die twice physically. And then you will experience the second death. And so <clears throat> it says they're cast into the lake of fire. And of course, we've already pointed this out, but Matthew 25, 41 tells us that this was originally designed, not with man intended to be the resident there, but for the devil and his angels. But because somebody has believed the devil and his lies, Rather than believing the, the God of the Bible and the truth, they ultimately will share their fate with the deceiver. And so they will find themselves in the lake of fire. 
The devil and the damned have punishment without pity, misery without mercy, sorrow without succor, no comfort for them, crying without comfort, mischief without measure, torments without end, and past imagination. This is the final destiny of the wicked. And it's so sad because God has designated two specific places where sin is dealt with, sin is punished. One is a place called Calvary, and the other is a place called hell. And if people refuse Calvary, then they are faced with the only alternative. If you won't allow Jesus to pay the penalty of your sin, then you must pay it. And sin against an eternal God merits eternal punishment. And so indifference to Calvary is the most costly mistake a person could ever make. And I think of the words of lamentation. I realize it's speaking of Jerusalem, but I can't help but re read these words without thinking of the Lord Jesus. And it's in connection with indifference to Calvary. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see, is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger? From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevaileth against them. We think of the sinner's substitute in those three hours of darkness. And it's almost as if the Lord is saying, is it nothing to you? Does it not mean anything to you that I'm going through all of this for you and you are not interested? You don't care? You want to pursue your own goals? Is, is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? And of course, on this coming day of judgment, they'll realize actually it was everything to them and they turned their back on it. What a tragedy it really is. Apathy to Calvary will mean punishment in the lake of fire. And so as we move into chapter 21, after that sobering description, and again, whoever, verse 15, was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the books of earth, the records of earth condemn them, their works, and the fact that their name is not in the book of life it doubly condemns them. And so therefore, they're cast into the lake of fire. And so then, having that judgment finished, now we move into the eternal state. And our next studies, we're really going to be considering the eternal state. What is the eternal state like? What where, what will be the eternal abode, abode of the of the saved be? What, what's our future look like? We've seen the, the, the future of those that are not saved, and it's a bleak future. And so he begins a, a description um, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So the idea is this, that the old order has passed away. We, we saw verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whom face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's the end of the old order. The, the old earth, the old creation, the heaven and earth fled away, it tells us. So the old order is passing away. By the way, just an interesting note that the Lord Jesus is not only the creator, but he's also the dissolver of creation. Right? Because from him, <laughs> heaven and earth fled away. So... He, he's the original creator. All things were made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. So he's the creator. He's also right now the, 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 the sustainer of it all, right? He, he keeps it working. He holds it together by the word of his mouth. Creator, sustainer, and ultimately dissolver. He's going to dissolve it all. The old order passing away. So let's look at a couple of other scriptures about this old order passing away before we begin to look at the new order. So I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. It says, 
14, verse 15, verse 24, it says, Then cometh the end. So now we're talking about the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So he's reigned for a thousand years. He's completed that. Even the father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority. So remember, Satan is put down. All, all his demons are put down. It's all finished. Everybody, all the sinners have been judged. He's put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That's all going to happen. The last enemy to, shall be destroyed is death, right? Death and hell cast into the lake of fire. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So basically, this is the coming of the end of the of all things, you know, the death and hell put away, all the rest of it. This is the old order passing away. And then one other portion, uh, Second Peter, that we might consider, and verse th uh, chapter three, um, second Peter three, verse uh, 10, it says, but the day of the Lord. Now, let me just pause there. It's interesting that Paul also talks about the day of the Lord in first Thessalonians five, but Paul looks at the beginning of the day of the Lord. He's bringing as the beginning of it. Peter is going to deal with the end of the day of the Lord. So they're both talking about the day of the Lord, but this, that period there's a beginning and there's an ending. So Paul looks at the beginning, Peter's looking at the end. And so it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for, hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So what's this end of all things? The whole thing is going to be burned up. Everything connected with it. All the stages of man's probationary testing are now completed. The seven dispensations have ended, right? The seven dispensations. We have prior to the dispensations, you have eternity. After the dispensations, you have eternity. So we've we've left the uh, the, the time as we know it, we're now in the eternal state. All the, the probation retesting is completed, and we now find ourselves in this eternal state. Now, as we look at these first eight verses of Revelation 21, seven of the verses deal with the saved, related to the saved, and one verse touches concerning the unsaved. That's verse 8. Just another observation, by the way, that actually there's very few portions of the word of God that actually deal with our eternal state, our eternal destiny. Little information about the endless condition of the saved is found in the word of God. And you might wonder, well, why is that the case? Why is there so little written about what we often call heaven? And I think it's because because the, the things there are so glorious and so wonderful that they defy description in human language. As if God was saying, wait and see. Wait and see. <laughs> we know this, that God never did a boring thing in his life. If you look at our creation, and of course here we are right now in this uh, uh, Turkey Hill area, uh, surrounded by trees that are beginning to turn uh, beautiful reds and i mean it's just magnificent this is a this is a fallen creation uh, last week when i was in the gas bay it, it caused me to gasp <laughs> it was it was beautiful i mean absolutely it was a beautiful sunny day one of the days it was absolutely gorgeous and so this is a fallen world. What is the eternal world going to be like for God who makes everything so interesting, 
Uh, even down to, you know, you look at a bug under the microscope and you see the colors and the these, it's incredible, you know. So, so what we can say is this, that it, we know our God well enough to know that he does all things well. And I don't think one of us will be even slightly disappointed when we're in the eternal state. <laughs> I think we're going to say, wow, oh, I'm so glad that I trusted Christ. What bliss is this? So we'll go with what details we've got, but I just want you to know there's not an awful lot of details. And it certainly, it, it, it has to be incredible. It's almost like in, in verse five, John says, and he that sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write for these words are true and faithful. And, and I think what he's saying is, uh, write these words that are true and faithful because it, it's like the glory of it all is so amazing. He almost has to affirm, this is really going to happen. This don't, this is real. This is something that's just as real as, as you can imagine. It's very real. And so he wants us to know that. And so uh, we want to just consider some things about this. Um, John, no doubt, marveling in the things that he did see. And so what do we learn? So let's just make a beginning. Our time is almost done this morning. But he says, uh there was no more sea. Now, I know you people in the Maritimes are thinking, we love the sea. It's beautiful. Like, I can't imagine a place where there's no sea. I mean, the reason we live here, despite the miserable weather, is because the sea is here, and we like the sea. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard. My wife finds Missouri very difficult. She grew up on the ocean uh, in Ireland, on the west coast of Ireland, and here we are, the most landlocked state in the union. I think she finds it very difficult. She misses the sea. But there's no sea in heaven. So why no sea? It's so essential to life right now, the whole cycle of things, right? The the rain and everything, it's, it's absolutely essential. So why is there no more sea? Well, let me just say this. Because um, 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by sea, but it's a, it's a witness to a collapsed canopy. Right? Where did that sea come from? Well, it goes back to the flood. Remember that there was this firmament in the heavens, and that firmament is a, is an evidence of divine judgment. I, I want to just say a couple of things because our time is running out. But when we think of sea, it always indicates separation. And what I mean by that, look at Acts 21. We'll just look at it briefly. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. And it gives us a, a little hint of what one of the, the wonderful truths about eternity. Verse 5, it says, When he had accomplished those days, we departed and were uh, went our way, and they all brought us on our way, wives and children, till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when he had taken taken our leave from one another, we took ship and there returned home again. And when he had finished our course from Tyre to Ptolemus, saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. The next day we were Paul's company, departed and came to Caesarea, uh, entered into the house of so on and so forth. But I just want you to notice that, that it's a time of saying goodbye, isn't it? They they knelt down on the shore and prayed. They were they, Paul was leaving. He was moving elsewhere. And I just want to say this, that I think we think of the sea, we, you know, we think of Mediterranean and all, and all the Bahamian beaches and all this kind of thing. And we, we look at it so positively. But throughout the history of the world, the sea was always a tragic place because it was always a place of goodbyes. I think of the Irish potato famine and people left on these coffin ships never to be seen again saying goodbye to their families. It was always connected with separation. And there will be no more sea. Because <laughs> there'll be no separation. We'll be together for eternity. And there'll never be any distance. Um, you know, my grandchildren are on the other side of the pond. <laughs> I'm glad for technology. But in eternity, no separation. We had a great three weeks with them, but it was very hard to say goodbye as they flew over the sea. Never going to have to do that again. We'll enjoy each other and the Lord without interruption for all eternity. There's no more sea.
and there's no more time <laughs> because our hour has just passed. May the Lord encourage us and stir us really with the things that we've considered about eternity. And we're going to say this, the half has not been told us. Amen.